Um, I think I'm on now and I want to welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, session and uh, keynote. Uh, when I was asked uh, whether I wanted to chair this keynote talk by Rana Mitter, I said immediately yes, because of two reasons. First of all, a talk by Rana is always stimulating. It's always an, a great event. It's always something you can learn from. And second, introducing Professor Rana Mitter is very simple because he is one of the most uh, influential, I think, historians of modern China. There is no question about it. He has written many books. All of them have had an immense impact on the field. He has mostly worked on uh, his uh, on Japan, on the war between Japan and China from 1937 to 1945. Both of the war itself, as well as on memories of the war and what they mean for today's China and the rise of nationalism in China. He has written many papers, many books, many articles, and he's re regularly given impact in various other media. Among them to mention is the BBC series, Chinese Characters. He has also published in Foreign Affairs in Prospect and also writes in newspapers. So he's a very visible historian of China, somebody who has, whose, whose opinion and whose viewpoints are really also heard in various contexts, in politics, in diplomacy, foreign policy, uh, and so on. So it's really great honor for me to be able to chair this session. And we have uh, we discussed beforehand um, how we are going to proceed. And Rana is going to give us uh, his talk, which will last for about uh, 40 minutes. And the title of the talk is China at the Dawn of the Cold War between Class War and the new internationalism. And afterwards, I will make a few comments and then we open up for discussion. So Rana, please, your turn. Klaus, thank you very much indeed for that very gracious introduction. Uh, let me say two things first, if, my, if I may. First, many thanks to Hong Kong Baptist for inviting me and inviting all of us to what's clearly been an immensely stimulating interdisciplinary conference. And as someone who you know, more than 15 years ago was very interested in the idea of Cold War as a cultural phenomenon, um, I'm really pleased to see that there are so many interesting takes on that idea in this conference. And secondly, the honor is entirely mine to be introduced by Klaus. Um, I won't go into all the many reasons why it's a great privilege to have someone who I know is immensely busy and immensely influential, not least as a university president, to take an hour out of his day, but also because I've made tremendous use of his wonderful big history of China, uh, making China modern, which if you have not read it, um, I would recommend you get a copy as quickly as possible. I see Klaus, you may even have a couple of copies over your shoulder. So if they are not available to the audience here, they're available certainly uh, online and through all good bookstores, and I'd highly recommend that. So as Klaus has uh, just said, I'd like to take about 35, 40 minutes to give some thoughts and reflections, very much I think in the theme, overall theme of this conference as a whole, but I will admit based on recent research I've been doing. And I hope that that, you know, in a sense is something that um, you will find useful, but I will find it useful too, because this is work in progress. Um, it is put forward as what's very kindly called a keynote speech. I think that just probably means one that's longer than any other, but I'm very interested genuinely in getting feedback and ideas and thoughts from Klaus and also from the audience. So scribble notes and get ready for a little bit of Q and A in the latter part of our, of our session. To explain what I'm up to, let me hope that technology is going to work with us. I'm sure it will behave. And I will go to the share screen. Okay. Beginning. Yes. I think that's going fine. And Klaus, if, as chair, if at any point it looks like the tech is not working or something's going wrong, you'll let me know. But otherwise, if I hear nothing, I will assume that we're working fine. Yes. Okay. So I want to read the Cold War. And I think by now, on day two of this conference, you've had more than enough definitions and discussions of quite what we might understand the Cold War being as a phenomenon. But I also want to read it, as I know some previous speakers have been doing, in a context which is just unavoidable, which is our own growing sense that between the West and China, there is a growing division of understanding and possibly something more disturbing than that as well. I don't think in this audience I need to say more than that, but the idea that looking at a previous Cold War 
in comparison with the current situation, which depending which interpretation you share, may be seen as a new Cold War or you know, interpretations, perhaps those I would prefer, a rather different sort of engagement and counter confrontation between two sides, but one where the, the Cold War, as we say, is good to think with. So with that in mind, let me take you, if I may, back to the dawn of that earlier Cold War, that 1945 cusp when things started to change again. And in doing that, let me just give you a few uh, pointers to where I want to uh, want to go. Just a reminder, first of all, that the end or the beginning of the Cold War in the Chinese context is often dated, and I'm talking here in a kind of very big sort of big sweep sort of way, as if the rise to power of Mao Zedong, the 1949 um, arrival of communist victory on the mainland, and then following that, of course, the establishment of a new regime, uh, still with us in a very different form, of course, today, that that was really the beginning of the kind of Cold War settlement in China itself. And of course, that's immensely important. But what I think I'm pushing back against, and I think I'll make this, if I made a sort of central thought that I'd like to give you for discussion uh, in, the, in the audience, is the idea that this is no longer sufficient. In other words, looking at the immediate years that follow, the kind of short intermission between 1945 and 1949, which is, of course, the dawn of the Cold War, I think you know, that's not in, in dispute, is also a period when a whole variety of processes and systems and also new ways of thinking, ideological formations, emerge in China in a way that is not just about the battle between communists and nationalists and the emergence of a Soviet versus US confrontation. It is, of course, those things which culminate in a civil war, the brutal civil war in, in China. But I think there is a growing sense, and uh, again, I can say more in Q&A if I don't already say it in the talk, in which the field of modern history needs to understand this period as being more pivotal than that, and not just a transition from essentially one brutal conflict against Japan to another one in a civil war to the arrival of, of new China. Um, one indication of that in Chinese public culture you have here in the image, just over five years ago now, in fact. Uh, oh, and God, I'm so sorry, I've realized I've mistyped, so I was doing this quite late at night, I think. I've mistyped the, the PPT, that should be 3rd of September 2015, not 16, uh, but just over six years ago, when Beijing uh, and when the Chinese Communist Party authorized a military parade in the center of Beijing in Tiananmen, square to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II in Asia, it was in a sense putting that 1945 as opposed to 1949 transition, that date of transition very much on the kind of official historical map. And in a week, in a day actually, I should say today when I'm speaking to you, when we're still absorbing the meaning of the new resolution on party history, First one, of course, in 40 years. We still only, I think, just have the communique version, but we're all, I think, I'm sure Klaus is looking forward to getting hold of his um, copy of the full text and reading through it and all sorts of, of detail. So at a moment when history really matters, and bearing in mind that that previous resolution in 1981 was many things, but also a product of the Cold War, which was still going very strong in 1981, uh, I think it's a reminder that historiography, periodization, and changing ideas of what the Cold War is have been with us in the Chinese context for really quite a long time. So in that context, I also want to just flag up in advance, because as I say, I'm being quite explicit, that there are some contemporary resonances. I'm gonna to get to the history in just a minute, I promise you. But there are some contemporary resonances that I really want to have ahead of time rather than after time running through you know, your thinking as we get to the, the, the historical Cold War element. So here's my second one. It's a map uh, of um, the you know, um, BRI, Belt Road Initiative, One Belt, One Road, uh, various names that it's gone under. Why do I flag this up? Because one of the themes that I want to bring up in more detail, I'll do it in just a few minutes, from the history of that earlier period, immediately post-1945, what I've termed the Chinese post-war in some of the writing I've, I've done, is that it's a developmental moment. For China. It's about the debate between different sorts of economic model, and the Communist Party is not the only actor that is involved in those discussions. And I want to flag up what the alternatives, both the internationalization of that conversation about economic development, 
And of course, the role of the defeated power, ultimately the Kuomintang nationalists as part of that too. So by flagging up the idea that, you know, BRI, it's about lots of things. It's about power projection, it's about prestige, but it is very much about economic developmentalism as an ideology, that that's not new, that there's a lot of that going on in the late 1940s that until recently, we haven't talked about a whole lot in the field, or at least I hope to persuade you. So contemporary resonance there. So let's start getting, if I may, to some of the indicators. And I'll do this and then I'll go through a couple of key points that I, I, I think provide the framework for, for what I want to, uh, to say. But let me just show you, first of all, visually with a bit of historical imagery, some of the ideas that I think mark this period. So as I've said, you know, if there is one dominant theme for very good reason, that dominates that period of the dawn of the Cold War, 1945, 46, maybe up to 49, 50, certainly, and again, I'm aware that my distinguished commentator is sitting in Berlin. I mean, probably the city in Europe of all that lived through that particular era in a way that the Cold War shaped. So, you know, I'm aware that there's a lot of resonances even within the context of this talk. But this image here, I think is one that is under um, appreciated in the Chinese context. So this is the signing of the United Nations Charter. And of course, you first of all get that meeting even before World War II has finished in spring of 1945 in San Francisco. Worth remembering that this is actually one of the first examples, even of a slightly forced one, of Guomindang CCP cooperation, because the delegation that was sent off to San Francisco from China to sign China's membership, of course, as Foreign Minister Wang Yi points out time after time when he goes and gives talks um, in uh, uh, overseas that China was not just a signatory, but the first signatory to the United Nations Charter. But what is often less um, remembered is that the delegation of about sort of 13, I think, senior uh, figures that were sent from China to 1945 at that very early, you know, post-1945 Cold War moment. Um, was mostly members of the Kuomintang, of course, the delegation was led by Chiang Kai-shek's brother-in-law, Song Zewen, TV Song. But under pressure, one Chinese de uh, communist delegate, uh, Dong Biwu, was included as well, and actually made quite a lot of use of his visit to the United States, where he also met um, overseas Chinese communities and various other actors. But the point is that at that very early moment, even though it was not acknowledged for a long time, really, by the CCP during the period when Mao's China was excluded from the UN, that actually not just China was there at the dawn of this new post-war settlement, but both the Kuomintang and in a smaller way, the CCP had a presence there at this moment. One of those things that again reminds us that the path to internationalization of China, which has huge resonance today, has some quite complex origins in that Cold War period. Now to talk about this period, I do have to flag up this gentleman here. I think to this audience, I don't need to explain too much, but just I will say, this is of course, Chiang Kai-shek, Jiang Jieshu, uh, General Asimo, President of China until his brief resignation in the beginning of 1949. But in the period we're talking about, uh, the end of the war against Japan and those early years of the post-war, 46, 47, uh, he's very much of course in charge of the national government of China and the negotiations with the CCP and various other of the activities that try and create some sort of stable settlement for China, which looked increasingly out of reach as the negotiations between General Marshall, the American general, and um, the CCP and KMT broke down during 1946, bringing about the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the civil war that we know eventually led to communist victory. That part of the story, of course, is well known. It came, of course, in the aftermath of China's experience in the Second World War. And when I, when I use this phrase, and I'll use it again right now, Jian Ho, post-war, about understanding the China of the years after 1945, I mean it in a very particular way. Uh, a few of you who have suffered through my writings may have you know, had to look through my explanations on this, but let me say it again, just, just in case, because I think it, to me it's important conceptually in understanding what happens in China during this, this, this period. 
talking about post-war Europe, in other words, a Europe both East and West that was basically reconstructing after 1945 is a very mainstream way of referring to the period. And um, I'm thinking here of the great um, British and then ultimately, I think, American historian Tony Jutt. About 10 years ago, he died. But his great you know, study of post-war Europe was just called post-war. In other words, it defined the whole period, decades after the end of fighting in Europe, as being a period in and of itself. Those of you who work on the Japan side will know that Sengo, exactly you know, that transcription of post-war, is a very mainstream term for that immediate post-war period after 1945 and the reconstruction of Japan and what follows. Up till now, up till now, there's a Freudian step up till now, but actually up till now as well, it's fair to, to, to say, that immediate period after the defeat of Japan in 1945, you do find the term John Holt, and if you search, search it, you can find it in various book titles and studies, but it hasn't become the most mainstream way of thinking about that period because it's been much more dominated in China by, of course, the Civil War, and then the arrival of Xinjiang, the new China, uh, up to Mao in 1949. So what I'm trying to do is to point out, and again, I'll give you more specifics in just a minute or two, that that world of immediate post-war China was a whole kind of world of decisions, choices, and expectations, the end point of which could not be known then as they are now, that actually are not simply a function of a civil war that was about victory between the communists or the nationalists. That was, of course, very important. We can't discount it. But I think we can't let it overwhelm our thinking, because what came before, as these figures show, was this immensely devastating and titanic war against Japan it lasted you know, eight years from 1937 to 45, led to certainly many millions of deaths, depending on which figures you take, eight to 14 million, some figures even more, but those I think are, are good to go with. 80 to 100 million refugees, mass bombing of the territory. In other words, understanding the China that, was ex that existed in 1945 as a post-war society in the way that we might think of the devastation of the city of Berlin or um, a whole variety, you know, the, the firebombing of Tokyo. Uh, these are comparisons that until recently, I have not think, I think have not been sufficiently made and understood because they shape a great deal, it seems to me, of the way in which what I've described in my title, I think defines that immediate post-war period, the dawn of the Cold War. One is a new internationalism, a new role for China in the uh, international society. And the other is something that I think we have to understand explicitly as class war. In other words, the sense of such huge, devastating social divisions that actually the possibility of finding that kind of coalition, the kind of compromise that the post-war actors were seeking to do may have been a chimera. We will see. Let me, in other words, use those thoughts to give you four points that I would like to make as I then move on into one slightly more involved case study that I think tells us a bit more about how some of these ideas could come together. But I need to talk a little bit about the framework here first with these, these bullet points, uh, if I may, so that I can see where, where we're going on this, uh, on this front. So in the post-1945 world, conceptually, China was engaging, of course, with the emergence of what we've come to know as the Cold War. But this was not simply a function of seeking a place somewhere between the Soviet Union and the United States of America. I mean, some of the very finest studies that we have of that period, I'm thinking of um, studies like uh, O.A. Vestad's classic Cold War and Revolution, explained to us in immense and granular detail how actually the complexity of that situation, you know, the Soviet adherence to the Chinese communists, then stepping apart from them in 1946, 47, then coming back and the amb ambiguity of the American positions too, make that Cold War diplomatic story much, much more complex than I think was realized before. So, you know, that is a very important part of the story. There's, there's no doubt about that. But I want to concentrate on some slightly different aspects in terms of pointing out what else I think is important. The first one is I think that China's involvement, and here I am talking about Kuomintang, nationalist China under Chiang Kai-shek, its involvement with international organizations really does matter at this point. The fact that China, through you know, the manipulations of President Roosevelt, but nonetheless 
still significant, becomes a permanent member of the UN Security Council at this point, does something really important in terms of placing China at the center of this newly involved outside, uh, outside framework. But it also does so in ways that China increasingly sought to make use of. So the United Nations, are probably the, the institution of the United Nations in that broad sense of the, of, of the term, um, that had most impact in China itself in those immediate post-war years, and in fact, the very late years of the Second World War and then the immediate post-war years, is the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, UNRWA, uh, which I've written about a bit elsewhere, but which strikes me as being very important because it provides both an opportunity for China to become very much embedded as a kind of in country with agency in the formation of these international institutions, but also, and here's crucial, here, here this is crucial, using the United Nations as a means of getting international assistance to push forward a model of development that could not have been carried out without overseas financing, but at the same time also in a post-1945 world, had to have China taking a leading role, the world in which China was sort of gratefully expecting, expected to kind of take assistance from um, um, uh, the Western world, was already beginning to crumble in a big way in 1945. And the quarrels and disputes amongst many of the American uh, officials of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration and Chinese officials such as, uh, I'll get on to, such as uh, Jiang Tingfu, the Chinese um, administrator of the, the Chinese equivalent body, um, became part of that first sort of clash of personalities and clash of policies in the post-war world. And they became important because of China's involvement for the first time as a sort of fully sovereign actor in international organizations. The second point, which flows almost directly from that, is that I think we've underestimated until recently the extent to which that first post-war China engaged with the post-imperialist world in general and also helped to push it forward. We sometimes forget quite how unusual China was as an actor in international society in 1945, because it had finally regained official sovereignty with the ending of the famous unequal treaties at the beginning of 1943, so exactly you know, 100 years and a few months after the uh, Treaty of Nanjing and the other first treaties that uh, had so oppressed the Qing dynasty. So the signing of those treaties basically put China back on a sovereign footing, but of course they have to wait two years until the war was actually won to be able to exercise many of those rights. But this also proved to be a great symbolic moment because in 1945, Japanese surrender in August 1945, very few other major actors in Asia, and almost none in Africa, had that kind of non-Western sovereign status. India would become independent soon, but not in 1945. Japan, of course, then became a sort of occupation state occupied by the, the Americans. Most of the uh, Southeast Asian countries essentially went back to their imperialist um, controllers, uh, Indochina for France, uh, Malaya for Britain, uh, Dutch East Indies for uh, Indonesia for, for, for Dutch, uh, and so forth. Korea, of course, under a United Nations trusteeship, at least initially. So actually, China's status at that point as not only a, at least in official terms, fully sovereign state, in practice, the sovereignty was much more fragile in various, uh, various ways, but also as a country that could, uh, you know, have this permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council, recently founded, and also essentially push forward a message about itself as a non-Western Asian power that had managed to use the war as an opportunity to gain sovereignty for itself, became very powerful as a beacon for independence uh, movements in Indonesia, um, uh, in the Philippines, and a whole variety of other places as well. The Philippines would become independent quite quickly afterwards, uh, 1946. Um, but at that post-war moment, China still stood as a pretty unusual actor in that, that context in the very early years of the Cold War. Third point I want to bring up, which comes from this, is that you can define the Cold War in a whole variety of ways, as you know, but one ideological way to think about it is that it's a battle about language. 
It's a battle about lots of other things. Of course, it's a battle about nuclear weapons. It's a battle about territory and about control. But it's also about the control of certain sorts of political terms and political uses of language. Now, at least in 1945, at least in official terms, what you might call the primordial fascist alternatives that had shaped much of Europe and Germany and Italy and, and beyond were essentially taken out of court. It was no longer valid. It was no longer legitimate to use the kind of anti-modern um, uh, primordial blood and soil type of language that so marked fascism in Europe. But you still, of course, had this immensely powerful ideological battle emerging essentially between the American dominated world and the, the Soviet dominated world, which was often about ownership of the same terms, about the terms democracy, freedom, um, peace, another one that became you know, very much part of, of at least one of the bloc's language. And because of this, there has been a tendency, I think it's now sort of you know, moving away, but there was a tendency for a long time to define almost all the debates over political change in that immediate post-war era as being a product of a debate purely defined by that Soviet-American dispute. In other words, um, you might always say it's a, it's a quarrel between the various children of the Enlightenment as to which of their children is legitimate and which of their children is illegitimate. And of course, the Soviet side saying that it's the Americans that are uh, illegitimate and the Americans saying, no, it's the Soviet side. And that, you know, has become, I think, a well-known series of debates, you know, is a people's democracy really a, a democracy or not? What I think that obscures in China is what I think is the really interesting set of debates that certainly took place within China itself in these years about what sort of political settlement would actually work for China at this stage. And I'm talking here in particular about things such as the debates around the constitution of 1946-47, which was briefly promulgated by the Kuomintang and then essentially you know, abandoned when Mao took over and then a new constitution, a well, set of new constitutions came in in the 1950s and, and beyond. I'm aware I'm speaking here to one of the great historians of Chinese law, so I have to be very careful uh, about this. But my debate, my discussion here is not really so much about law as it is actually about, although of course it's connected, but about political ideology and debates about what democracy is supposed to mean. And one of the things that I think, again, has been underestimated is the level of different debates about what kind of political formations might actually be stable and valid in a China of that sort, even if they didn't match what either of the Cold War actors, the Soviets as well as the Americans, thought would be right for China. So both the CCP and the Kuomintang are arguing about democracy, but even during that time, the Kuomintang's definitions stretch from those actually of party liberals always a minority, a real minority of the Kuomintang, but a very loud minority. So people like Jiang Tingfu and actually Foreign Minister Wang Shijie, who um, again, um, had written extensively on Western constitutions. That was one of his big things when he was a law professor before he became a, uh, a politician. I don't know if uh, our honorable uh, Professor Muhan might take that direction next, but perhaps we shouldn't ask too much about that side of his future. We'll stick to Wang Shijie back in, in the 19, 1940s. And these discussions are immensely interesting and rich in certain ways, because they're informed by something that in a sense was best put by the philosopher Yang Shuming uh, in Gaiolito's famous book known as The Last Confucian. But one of the things he does is write very extensively at this point about how whatever kind of political system China's gonna have, it's not gonna look like a Western system. Now, we all know what eventually happened in 1949, but I think that the level of variation and I use the word diversity, in terms of political possibilities for China, at least in theory, even against the reality of a kind of quickly disintegrating civil war scenario in the country, shouldn't be underestimated, partly because once again, there is a resonance with some of the debates that are tearing us apart in today's new Cold War that maybe isn't a Cold War between the US and China, in which ownership of terms such as democracy and freedom is still very much at the center of discussion. And if you doubt me, think about all those shohei the 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 socialist values that are being plant, you know, plastered all around Beijing. If you look at them, there are about 12 of them. Half of them are nothing particularly, anything much to do with shohei at all. Zuyo, freedom. 
interesting, neutral democracy. So I'm betting that whatever the CCP and the new party resolution means by those terms, it ain't going to be the same thing that Joe Biden and Jake Sullivan mean by those terms. And thinking about that earlier era in the late 40s, when people in that brief window of post-1945 China had some space and had some opportunity both to debate publicly and to also record in private. I'm, I'm thinking here of things like the diary of Wang Shijie, which I found very interesting and have read quite extensively uh, in recently as a way of debating some of these, these issues. So there's constitutional political debates over liberalism and non-liberalism and what it might mean. I think are a more important part of this bigger discussion of what a non-Western global South post-colonial, whatever you want to call it, state is supposed to look like in this early Cold War settlement. And finally, in this list, links to that, I think that that brings us to you know, that issue of class war that I've mentioned, because domestic political change in China is centered, amongst other things, on ideas of social welfare. In other words, the idea that the state has to grow and provide more for the wider population. Now, one of the things I think recent work in recent years has established, I think fairly clearly, is that a caricature of the pre-communist regimes, the Kuomintang and, and others, as having done nothing about wider social welfare or common prosperity, as we might call it these days, the Kung Tung Fu Yi, um, it's just that a caricature. There's a great deal of thinking about social welfare, about how a kind of reconstituted developmental Asian state, which doesn't have very much money, nonetheless can think about operating in that Cold War, post-war world. Fine. But what I think we then do is to point out that the CCP's alternative, land reform and revolution rather than reform, sits in a spectrum rather than being viewed as purely oppositional. In other words, the idea simply of a kind of collapsing Guomindang state, which of course does collapse very badly by the, the middle of that civil war period, as having not thought about these issues or put in any kind of implementation at the beginning of what might be uh, the beginning of that kind of reformist welfareism, has to give way to the idea that you have this set of um, measures that are too, too little, too late, but nonetheless are attempt to address the same questions that the CCP eventually managed to solve through extremely violent class warfare, as we are, uh, are, of course, aware. And if I add to that just these brief factors that I've got here in terms of the way in which not knowing the future, the Guomindang, and then, of course, you know, the CCP in response, are thinking of questions that matter at this stage. The first one there is what Asian order is going to look like in the post -cold, the coast, the Cold War era. What is the sustained role of the Guomindang going to be in the region at a time when they thought, and at least for a couple of years, most of the Western world and the Soviets thought that Chiang Kai-shek's government would be around for a long time. Linked to that the second question of placing China within a liberal international order, if it was that, the American dominated order, was it genuinely an emerging liberal state and therefore were the, were the Americans right to be disappointed at the fact that it didn't appear to be one? Or was it more a non-liberal state in a wider liberal order? And was that a legitimate thing for it to, uh, to be? Uh, I'd add then so that development of that post-colonial identity in the non-European world, influenced by the genuine anti-colonialism of Guomindang politicians over many years. And finally, as I've said, the nature of that Chinese domestic state in matters from constitutional change to social welfare changes under international influence. The presence of institutions such as the United Nations in its earliest forms in China in these years really matters. It's not a kind of optional add-on. It helps to shape part of the discourse. Let me show you why I think that's the case. So let's focus in for a few minutes now on UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, which um, these are pictures from 1945-46 of uh, some of the offices and telegrams related to materials on it, but it was founded in 1943, finally wound up, operation, wound up operations in China in 1947. It was led by a very distinguished public servant, uh, Jiang Tingfu, professor of history at Nankai and Tsinghua Universities, then went into public service. He never joined the Guomindang as a party member, if I'm correct, but he did serve the Guomindang government pretty extensively, uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union, director of the China National Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, the sister organization to the UN um, entity. And he eventually, his last big public job was ambassador to the United Nations, 
uh, which he served you know, on the mainland until 1949. And then when Taiwan was given the UN seat for the Republic of China, served in Taipei and New York um, until I think the, I think 1963. Uh, 62. So um, you have there a nice picture of uh, Chiang Tingfu at the UN, at the China seat. Please bear that in mind, because I'll show you another image in a minute that contrasts with that. So in other words, you have figures like this. Chiang Tingfu, I think, is a really interesting liminal figure, threshold figure, turning point figure, because, you know, he's in that gray zone, which you don't really have, perhaps again until the 1980s in some ways in China, and even then it's not quite the same, of major intellectual figures who are not totally sold by any means on the Kuomintang's political experiment and think it's far too hardcore and not liberal and democratic enough, but still see it as a legitimate nationalist vehicle through which to press China's national interests in a world where the Americans and the Chinese and the Soviets both want to tell the Chinese what to do. And that ambiguity, and it is real, I think again is, is one of those things that's well worth noting for those who are analyzing China today, who often find it difficult to understand how today's Chinese intellectuals, in many cases, can simultaneously be highly critical of many of the very repressive actions of today's Chinese government, but also broadly supportive of many of its nationalist goals. And this earlier period and the kind of fluidity of the early Cold War, I think is a really interesting little case study in how those mindsets, those attitudes can be held simultaneously and in some ways are not entirely surprising. So Jiang Tingfu, runs uh, the Chinese sister outfit or parallel outfit to the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. And this image, I think, gives an image of uh, another, another theme I want to put in as to why I think this period is so important. Because we tend to think about, as I say, about civil war, of course, big armies clashing, Lin Biao, and uh, Du Yuming, and, you know, KMT, CCP. But we sometimes forget that this is still a China in 1946, 47, 48, that's hugely shaped by the massive movement of refugees. Remember I mentioned Stephen McKinnon and others does wonderful research on how 80 to 100 million people became refugees in China during the war against Japan. They didn't just all go home overnight. The movement of population, population mobility, and I have a new piece which isn't yet out, but it's coming out in the Journal Itinerario actually next year, which looks at this question of dislocation and relocation as a shaping factor in early Cold War China. That, I think, can be brought home by looking at, you know, this one typical image of a refugee camp uh, in uh, Wuhan, in fact, a city which is very famous these days for slightly different reasons, but this is in Wuchang. And it's an example of how this huge, you know, growth of a refugee population that's created by the war against Japan is also a massive popular shaping factor in driving that sense that China needs radical solutions that are going to deal with these huge human uh, disasters that have been going on, and yet another fueling factor for what we ultimately see as the kind of radicalism of class warfare and the land reform, the Tugai, that begins to emerge in large parts of northern China as the CCP gathers pace in terms of its control. Here we have another image, I just thought this was uh, kind of get a rather, rather good typical one with this quote here from the uh, United Nations UNRWA um, team, this little war refugee, takes very seriously his job of guarding the family possessions while his elders set up their new home in Tent City, a canvas community provided for refugees in Wuhu in Anhui, so this is Anhui, by Anra and Sinra. This little boy is one of millions of people at this point who are in refugee camps. We have got already now, I think, a really rich historiography of refugee movement and displacement in Europe during this period, everything from you know, the Germans who had to flee what had been East Silesia during that era, making their way west, to the huge population movement of Central Europe during this era, which also became part of that kind of flux that shaped Cold War politics during that time. So that historiography is beginning to really become very rich in the European field. In the China field, it's becoming richer, but it's still in a much earlier stage of development. And I think this question of how refugee flight is not just about World War II, which in itself is a relatively new field, but actually really shapes this post-war moment, I think is something we need to do more with. And as I say, I'm doing a little bit, I hope myself, to try and put some scholarship into the, the field on this question. Why does this all come together? Well, again, time is marching on again, and I don't want to take up all the time because I want to hear, we all want to hear from Klaus and then we want to have some Q&A, but let me bring it up if I may in the last few minutes to how I want to bring some of these threads together. So all of these ideas, 
the idea of China as an international actor that's in the United Nations at the top level, but also dependent on the new United Nations to try and fund this kind of relief of refugee disasters and instead creating a new kind of economic developmental state that will reform a nationalist Kuomintang China into something post-colonial, nationalist, but new, gives way, of course, as we know, to the communist revolution. In the end, the class warfare becomes more powerful than this idea of a kind of internationalist developmentalism that China's previous leaders were hoping to implement. Ultimately, though, in a strange way, as you know, what goes around comes around. And by the 1970s and 80s, I mean, first of all, that economic developmentalism certainly did start to develop in China, but it developed in a way that essentially came from drawing from some of those lessons in Deng Xiaoping's reforms after everything else had been tried, including mass collectivization, the breakdown of that system in the late Cultural Revolution, and the emergence finally of a market-driven socialist economy, of which my sort of image here of uh, two farmers, uh, uh, man and a woman uh, in a field is meant to be representative. But also to bring us round, a, <coughs> excuse me, at the end to where we started, if you remember my previous image, I'll just show you once again, of Jiang Tingfu right there, sitting as China's ambassador to the UN, representing the ROC on Taiwan uh, in New York. Well, of course, after a recognition in the early 1970s, uh, the Chinese uh, PRC held exactly the same seat, even possibly the same nameplate that we have there uh, for, for, for China. And the internationalization, which had been in motion in those early post-war post -war years, the early Cold War years, and then was taken massively off track by the exclusion of China from the uh, Cold War international order uh, because of its lack of di diplomatic recognition or UN representation, finally coming to uh, a circle as the PRC takes over the UN seat and then eventually gets, of course, recognized by the United States um, at, the, uh, at the end there. So, let me use those thoughts, as I say, to put a pause where we are now. I'll sort of stop sharing so we can bring in these thoughts, but point out that my, my final message on this is that I think that that immediate post-war period is very rich because it contains the seeds and the starting points for an awful lot of things that are false starts or things that don't come to, to fruition, fruition until much, much later, decades later in some cases. But you can see many of the origins of everything from Global South leadership, to economic developmentalism, to debates about whether or not liberal political alternatives are really suitable for global South societies, beginning to come you know, into flower in that era. And although the massive civil war that shapes China during that period is a reality that we simply can't ignore, it's historically you know, ridiculous to do that, understanding the period as being more than just the clash of armies also, I think, gives us new ways of thinking about why the Cold War in that wider sense is a really interesting period also for the development of a much longer trajectory to do with China. So I will stop there if I may, Klaus, and hand over to you for some thoughts and comments and to chair the rest of the session. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you very much, Rana. This was, as I anticipated, a brilliant uh, talk and a really stimulating uh, talk and a new look, a refreshing new look on this era, uh, this time period between 45 and 49. And I think I find this uh, extremely convincing. Uh, the main point of your talk, of course, being that we have overlooked this period. It's a pivotal period uh, in Chinese history where a period where modern China or let's say contemporary China really takes shape. And that some of the structures, ideas, discussions that we see arise in this period are relevant for today's, today's China um, as well. And I, I can only agree um, uh, to this uh, basic analysis. Uh, there is no question that China in mid 20th century was an enormously diverse, varied, of course, war-torn and profoundly shaken, um, but also creative uh, terror. And um, I think it's also become clear um, from the talk and uh, also from uh, what we know about this history that there were so many more alternatives at this period of time. Um, alternatives both to Chinese communism and to the post-war development. I mean, there were capitalists, Christians, Buddhists, liberal intellectuals, other followers of value and faith um, who, 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 who offered these uh, you know, alternative 
perspectives. But of course, we also know there were black markets, smuggling and gambling rings, and various forms of dissent and outright opposition. So it's a really lively, interesting, fascinating um, period. And I think pointing this out uh, is uh, absolutely right, and I can fully uh, agree with this. I would like to make two brief points before I open up for um, discussion that I think could add, yeah, let's say, um, another, another perspective or dimension uh, to this talk. And I think the first one uh, being that at this time, at this period, what uh, most historians have, of course, also written about is the entire development that happened in uh, Yan'an and in the areas under communist control. Actually, something that we know very little about, because the so-called communist liberated areas were, of course, much larger, much bigger than only Yan'an. I mean, they were increasing rapidly, and they were also very diverse. And we also know that various experiments were made in these areas. For instance, when it comes to land reform, very different approaches being tried and tested in society um, and, and, and then learn from them and then discussed back and forth. So my point would be there's an entire other you know, area or sphere in this period where we may find actually similar you know, where you might find confirmation for your basic analysis, because certainly social welfare, big topic within these uh, liberated areas. They were also internationalist in a sense, because we know, of course, there were first foreign uh, uh, Soviet advisors in particular at uh, being active, and there were links uh, to other areas. And uh, you also highlighted, of course, the uh, constitutional debates, which we also know happened. In, in the in the communist area. So so I think looking at the communist areas might actually strengthen your point, you know, and and add, add uh, another and I think important dimension to it. And then I would also argue, however, because you pointed uh, these out these uh, tendencies and developments uh, that I think uh, are undisputably uh, important, but we may also see in this area, even if it's an uh, area of war and, and civil war and conflict and contestation, but I do think we see also efforts uh, to strengthen state control. You know, and this is a long-term project that I think leads back to the 1930s, but is continued uh, during this uh, period of time. So the states, the various states built uh, their networks of control. Uh, you know, they, they invest heavily, uh, of course, in intelligence services, in, uh, in, in penal practices. Uh, also, this is often overlooked, but you know, there is, of course, they are not only refugees, they are also prisoners of war. There's a lot of people captive, kept uh, in captivity uh, during this period of time. So I think what we see here is, you know, a profound centralization that start, that's products that start also thinking, you know, even despite under difficult uh, circumstances, but there are plans being made. There is this big lesson that is being learned that China needs to have a strong state uh, in order to survive. And again, I think this is also a project that is more international than we often, uh, uh, that we often look at this. So that would be my, uh, my second point. And the third point, final point, if I may, concerns periodization. Because, I mean, of course, you look at the period of 45 to 49, and it makes a great deal of sense. And of course, we know before the war, um, is there, there, are, there are continuities you know, that go beyond 40, 45. But I'm also thinking that beyond 49, uh, we see these continuities. So for instance, I think that the constitutional debates continue up until the 19, early 1950s in China. And we know that because the Communist Party you know, starts its, its heavy handed political campaigns exactly you know, against those people uh, and those uh, groups that have been involved in the discussions before 45, uh, before 49, sorry, to have misspoken also, when it comes to war, and also, you know, it, the hot war doesn't really end for China in, in 49, right? It, the hot war goes on because China immediately sends troops to the Korean battlefield. Um, so one wonders how useful it is, uh, you know, to, to sort of limit the, the discussion on, 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 on the time period between 45 and 49, 
because they seem to be really important and strong. So I'll stop here. That leaves us with exactly uh, 10 minutes. If you want to briefly respond, uh, or should I look at the questions uh, um, if we have? Uh, and we've got a message here saying, Profs, it's okay to overrun by 10 minutes. So we this can, is excellent. Yeah, yeah I've just it, seen it. So in which case, why, why don't, don't I give a, a, a brief, yeah. brief response to your points while they're fresh in, in everyone's minds, class, and then we'll see if we yeah. you know, want to pull in one or two thoughts from, from others. Thank you for, as I expected, a really you know positive but very useful critique of, of some of those thoughts. And you know, I, first thing to say is I entirely agree with all of those. Let, let me uh, respond you know, to, to each of them briefly. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, again, of course, you're absolutely right that one of the questions of how the strong state really emerges is common to all the major actors at this time. And in the end, I think is one of the reasons why a very brief and rather faltering liberalism in some quarters doesn't really ever take off because, you know, that the fear that exists in society as a result of the dislocations of the previous wartime period just make it very difficult for that kind of um, uh, more kind of free freewheeling uh, vision of society to, to have any any purchase. So I think looking again, as you pointed out, you know, you know that world very well, intelligence, captivity and so forth, I think it's really important to, to, to do. I was really glad also you made those other two points because they're both things that actually I absolutely agree are very central. Let, let me deal with them, each of them briefly. Um, in another part of the project, and again, obviously, I sort of selected a bit, um, you know, for the sake of a 40 minute uh, talk, but I've been spending a lot of time actually in the last few weeks and months with materials, including diaries of CCP cadres of this period, uh, both men and women. And actually, that is important because actually one of the things I'm trying to do with that is to understand how, you know, it's a long term project. And a lot of people have written about it in different ways. But, you know, how do people become revolutionary? How do they become communist? How do they actually share the mindset? And we all know that diaries, even private ones, are not an absolutely transparent way of understanding the mindset. But a lot of things, including understanding the process of ideological change is really interesting when you see it happening day by day in real time in terms of the physicality of struggle meetings and how people are made to sort of you know uh, reflect uh, on their um, personal subjectivity and people you know start using these terms which sound very clunky to, to western liberals you know uh, pretty bourgeois consciousness these sorts of terms but it's very clear that over time particularly with the young they become a very natural way of thinking. And I found myself thinking this morning, I was writing an op-ed for a British um, newspaper uh, about you know, the res new resolution on party history or what we have of it. And pointing out that when you translate bits of it, it sounds very clunky, you know, Marxism for the new era, uh, the contemporary era, and, you know, uh, containing the, the spirit and the essence of Chinese culture. It sounds either bland or uh, in some ways rather um, stylized, but actually understanding the context in which political language emerges and becomes powerful or not, I think is really important. And the CCP, as we know, were absolutely brilliant at this. And understanding through some of that documentation of how they did it, combined with the reality of you know, the violence of land reform and, and the ambiguities that fit into that is a really important part of the project. So thank you for mentioning that. And you know, when at some point it does all eventually come together as a longer study, that will absolutely be part of it. As will indeed your final thought, which I thought was really very important in, in, indeed. I don't actually simply make the periodization in the wider project ending in 1949. I tentatively have it sort of going at some set sense into the mid 1950s and thinking about possibly, you know, you might put Bandung as you know an end point in terms of internationalization. You might put the end of the Korean War. But the idea that certainly you have to look across that boundary, it has become more mainstream. In a long way, thanks to the work of you know Jeremy Brown, Matthew Johnson, all the kind of wonderful people who've done the everyday Maoism work. But in a sense, I think what I'm trying to do is almost the other direction, which is rather than say not everything begins in 1949 and stuff continues over, but then it's about projecting forward. Instead, trying to sort of look at this period as perhaps one that's kind of liminal in itself, and starting at perhaps in the very last years of the war against Japan, and then moving all the way into the early years of, of the PRC but seeing some of these dynamics as being ones that are distinctive to that period um, uh, as, uh, as well. But certainly just stopping on whatever, 1st of October, 1949, I think actually for historians, all of us who work in this field is no longer an, uh, an option. We, we know that there is, there is no such thing as Stunde Null um, and that we have to, to understand the, the, the transitions much more clearly. So let me stop those, those thoughts there because I'm sure you want to bring in some further discussion. Thank you very much, Rana. So please, for the audience, please post your questions uh, in the F and A section or in the chat. Uh, 
And there's one question um, which I'm going to read to you, Rana, and um, that's from Terry and George. And he says, you know, I wonder, Rana, where you could place Chang Pang Chun, who was on the drafting committee of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yes, which I find is very fascinating because I've, I've written about this person and, and the work he did on this uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Rana, please. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Cherry Ann and Klaus as well, as well. And of course, there is actually recently a biography done by, I think, uh, Ingvar Roth, uh, based out of Sweden, on, on you know, this fascinating mm -hmm. character. I think many here will know, but just a reminder, that uh, Jiang Kondrun was a very uh, distinguished uh, philosopher. And one of the non-Western, you know, I want to put it that as all sorts of defining people as what they're not, but in this case, you know, kind of global south, um, intellectuals who had input into that amazing document, the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And of course, it's always now the kind of trump card when today's China says, you know, these human rights, they're a Western idea. You say, no, 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 PC Zhang, you know, Zhang Kuang-jun uh, was one of the signatories, along actually with other non-Western uh, thinkers. I'm thinking Charles Malik from Lebanon being you know, one of the very prominent ones in that, in that sense. Where does he fit in? I think he fits in actually rather well in terms of the way in which this period is being rethought both by the PRC and by historians. And I say that these are not the same thing. So in terms of the PRC, there is now a real rehabilitation of elements of what the Guomindang government did on the international scene, not in terms of the civil war, but in terms of the international scene during these years. So today's China spends a lot of time talking about Mei Ru the uh, Chinese judge who was on the International Military Tribunal of the Far East, the Tokyo trials, as they're generally known. And, you know, it was a Kuomintang judge, it wasn't a CCP judge, but they, they very much put that, that, that forward as something that shows China's internationalization during that period. They're very keen, as people know, to bring up the maritime um, boundaries that emerge as part of the um, uh, um, post-1945 uh, carving up of territories in, in the South China Sea and elsewhere. So, you know, famously, the first maps with dashed lines appear under the aegis of the Guomindang government during that time, and they are just taken up wholesale by today's PRC. But those have to do more with territorial issues rather than necessary, or power issues rather than values issues, you might say. And I will say that although there is acknowledgement of PC Zhang, He's not stressed in terms of the wider sense of the PRC's you know, use of that period to define its continuity in international society. But historians have found him very interesting because he speaks very strongly to some of those issues I mentioned, such as debates on liberalism, constitutionalism, democracy and what it means. And the ability to come up with some sets of shared values that suggest that you can actually adapt these ideas to different cultures without going down, you know, what I think Zhang himself would regard as a slightly blind alley of saying cultures are so different from each other, you can't possibly have any kind of crossover in terms of those value uh, value driven areas. So, yeah, I think Zhang is a really interesting character and definitely a good one uh, to know more about in terms of uh, thinking. And of course, Klaus is someone who I think maybe you have thoughts, Klaus, on what, what you think uh, Zhang's role is. I suspect you, you being more expert than me on that. I wouldn't say that, but um, let me, before I say something, uh, let me just um, call on the audience to use sure. the stands to ask uh, questions uh, for Rana and uh, or comment on his excellent talk. So this is a chance that you should definitely use. Yes, I think this is a fascinating, so while we wait for another question, um, oh, there is oh, always- Oh, I see one just came up. Yes, I will, I will, I will uh, read yeah. it, yes. Um, the question here is to what extent the so-called Cold War 2.0 be understood by binaries of US versus China when there sure. are so many other actors on the rise? Um, and also I see there's a follow-up, which is, and keeping in mind that traditional democratic societies are defining and refining their own, own democracy. Well, both, both true, of course. Um, I think actually the binary is dangerous and it's misleading. Um, I mean, first of all, one binary is dangerous in that it's not just the US, you know, a broader, um, what would you call it, uh, repertoire of states that are concerned to make sure that the existing post-1945 order remains fairly stable in Asia and beyond, uh, do share a set of agendas, and it's not just about the United States. So that's a warning for China, I have to say, not, not to, to try and make it binary. But then let me flip it the other way and say there's also a warning for the United States and Western European actors, 
which is that it's often not understood that another binary is between security and economics. Pretty much every actor in the Asia Pacific region has China as its major trading partner, including lots of ones that have a security alliance with the United States. And many countries in the region therefore also find that they're being put in a very difficult position if it's suggested either by China or by the US that they have to choose between them. I think the general sense in the Asia Pacific region broadly is that a lot of countries do still welcome American security guarantees and would be upset if America left the region. Those same countries also value entry to the Chinese market in terms of economic terms and would find themselves impoverished if they were not given access to it. So the difficulty will remain, I think, in the balancing of those two factors. But the interdependence of those issues is one of the reasons why it's not a Cold War in the classic 1940s sense, I think, because of the economic element is, is defined in a very different sort of, uh, of way. And that second question you had there, Anilesh, about traditional democratic societies. Um, well, I would say that um, there is a um, certainly a very worrying turn, not so much against democracy in the very strict sense of people voting in elections, but against all the things that make up a stable, as opposed to a fragile democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of media, recognition that diversity and dissent in society is a valuable thing, not a, an undermining thing. Uh, these have become harder to find in many places, including India, the Philippines, uh, indeed, in a different context, the United States, um, Hungary, Poland. Um, th these are places where actually a lot of these values have seemed much more fragile than they might have done. And of course, it's one of the things that fuels a Chinese discourse that maybe these values are not either as universal or as robust as the wider world has claimed them to uh, to be. So we'll see where that discourse goes, but just to bear in mind that, as I said, a version of it was going on way back in the, the 40s. Klaus, Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, Klaus, I have a question from here, from Hong Kong. Uh, from okay. the university, if I may. Yes. yes. Um, thank you. I'm Daya Tusu. I'm a professor here. Hi, Rana. Great to hear you. Um, the question I have is about um, the role of China in being the leader of global south. You alluded to that once or mm -hmm. twice in your talk, mm -hmm. although you're talking about a very specific period of Chinese history. Um, I was thinking in Bandung, China was very much present. But then it sort of left that space for India or Egypt or Indonesia, you know, in terms of non-aligned movement. China was not a major player in that. Uh, what would be your explanation for that withdrawal from what was yeah. the most important at that time? Yeah. Third world yeah. yeah, I think it's more than that, actually. It's a great question. It becomes actually a, a kind of battlefront within the Cold War itself, because the reason is that once you have the defeat of the nationalist Chinese in the civil war, but the maintenance of nationalist China as the internationally recognized representative of China at the UN, and also, of course, recognized by the most powerful country, the United States, that meant that essentially there was a split in terms of international legitimacy when it came to which China represented that country in international bodies. And part of the problem with that was that you know, China could turn up at Bandung and, and elsewhere and actually did make something, you know, PRC, made something of a splash with you know, Zhou Enlai's very suave diplomacy. But in the end, that China still was not the China that was recognized at the United Nations, whereas Taiwan was ex increasingly excluded and instead found its new friendships with a variety of very strongly anti-communist international groups. So their friends became South Korea, South Vietnam, you know, while that still existed as a country, um, and the more sort of American-oriented developmentalist but fiercely anti-communist countries that um, formed an alternative sort of alliance. So in a sense, the Chinese presence was split in a way that India's was not. You know, Nehru was the thought leader. Nehru was the figure who was recognized as having the prestige of having led an independent struggle. And so in that sense, the, the completeness of the narrative around Nehru couldn't be easily reproduced in the context of a kind of disruptive revolutionary China on the mainland and a kind of remnant nationalist version that had some international legitimacy, but very little territorial control. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So I'll have two more questions. And I sure. think if we take these two questions and then uh, you answer them together, then of course should be fine in regard to the time. So the question here in the chat is, Xi Jinping calls for innovative social governance as a new concept to resolve social conflicts. What has been the role of dissent 
in narrating Chinese history. So that's the one question and I have here, uh, Mr. Mikhailovich. Uh, yes, so if you would like to ask a short question, please. Yeah, it's a very short question. Uh, China after 45 and between 49 and maybe 54 was mostly oriented on local development in producing the goods they consumed themselves rather than looking for the West. Then uh, something has happened um, when international stance was adopted as a main line. All these uh, home oriented policies were gradually decreasing, altering and removing the gumos of intellectuals and uh, toiling workers from the horizon of the Chinese life with, resulting in the cultural revolution is that why do you think such a turn to uh, very narrow internationalism that was leading to an impasse was picked up by Mao and the communists? Thank you. No, great question from Professor Mikhailovich. Um, I mean, it's a huge topic, but let me focus in on one very specific turning point again in the early 1950s, which I think provides, you know, it's very rare in history that you can find sort of historical turning points that, that lead in quite clearly opposite directions. But I think that this one is, is quite important. In the early 1950s, both China and the United States make choices that I think turned China in that very inward looking direction that you mentioned. And both countries had an option not to do that. So the first one is China, as we know from the work of Chen Jian and others, deciding for a variety of ideological and pragmatic reasons to enter into the Korean War, even when the PRC state was still very unstable and hadn't yet been you know, fully solidified. Um, and you know, there are reasons to do that. But one of the things that that did, amongst other things, actually, was to mean that China's chance of getting Taiwan back were much reduced. The, the Truman administration, I think, would have probably let them take it. But when it came to the Korean War breaking out, Taiwan suddenly became a major Cold War, War ally. So China, in a sense, actually kind of blew up some of its own chances of reconciliation with the Western bloc had it wanted to do that at that stage. However, I personally think it was also a great mistake for essentially the Eisenhower administration and Dulles in particular, John Foster Dulles, to insist on the non-recognition of PRC after 1953, because as you know, they recognized the Soviet Union, they were certainly in deadly, you know, virtual combat with the US, uh, USSR, but they recognized them at the UN, they had embassies and so forth. The lack of willingness even to acknowledge the legitimacy of the PRC, I think is one of the factors that turned China, mainland China, into a state which went for kind of crazy policies like the Great Leap Forward, which went for policies like the Cultural Revolution, which were very much a kind of inward looking, directed policy that were based about you know, China being out against the rest of the world. And it wasn't, of course, until late, the early 70s that you get the reconciliation with the, the United States that changes some of that, um, that aspect. So I would say that mistakes both on the Chinese and the American side um, pushed China in the direction that you've described. It was not, I think, an inevitable outcome because very few things are inevitable unless you, know, you uh, think that you, know, you follow a, a doctrine of historical determinism. Uh, but those were certainly important turning points that, that point in the direction that you mentioned. Thank you. That's very clear and second. Thank you. Okay. So I think we are now Ooh. 10 after 12. Um, I think we are. Yeah. So I think that would be about time. So thank you very, very much, Rana, for the, this really brilliant talk and clear responses to the questions and uh, thank you very much for the, the and i want to also thank the audience for asking questions and yeah bye bye thank you. you indeed well thank you all very much thank you klaus thank you audience sorry i didn't get to all the questions and hope to see you in hong kong or oxford right. or somewhere yes. one of these days but thank you for your yeah. time today appreciate it bye bye yeah my pleasure bye 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 bye